So welcome, welcome everybody to a new Rebalance talk today with Drago Simandan, which uh, geographer born in Romania with a PhD in England, now professor of geography at Brook University in, in Canada, in Toronto. Great to have you here, Dragos. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's quite <laughs> an exciting opportunity. You rarely have a chance as an academic to really speak about your work and its internal relationships. Usually you go to conferences, you give a speech on a predetermined topic, you have 15 minutes to express yourself and you have to be narrow and focused. So uh, it's quite uh, exciting and I'm looking forward to, to get a chance to have a, a full hour to explore uh, various connections between different parts of my of my uh, work and the project you are involved in with uh, mobilities yes like you know our aim is to influence to influence european policy makers so mm -hmm. we have a, a good chance to do so let, let me begin by by your concept of surprise we always mm -hmm. begin the, the conversations asking uh, asking about the impact of the pandemics and then, and then you have this, this, this concept of surprise, which is linked to the way you understand prediction in social science, your, your let's say, epistemologic geography. And, and this concept of surprise is somehow related to the concept of event by, by Chisek or catastrophe by Dupuy, you know, contingency by Rorty. Death is always a surprise for us, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pandemic was a surprise. So, can you further develop for us? Yes. So, in the concept of surprise, and what do you mean by surprise? Yes. So, a, a good way to define surprise simply and sufficiently memorably is to say that surprises are refuted expectations. You have a particular expectation about how the future will turn out. The future turns out and it doesn't happen the way you expected, and then you are surprised. Right? So surprises are refuted expectations, right? And then we can begin to classify surprises into various uh, categories. You can have bad surprises or positive surprises by their magnitude. You can have a minor surprise that you quickly forget about or a major surprise that affects your way of thinking dramatically, right? And we can also think in terms of the scaling up of surprise. You can, you can have an individual private surprise, but we can also have collective surprises as a society, uh, as an institution, and so on. And what I think is uh, fascinating about surprise is, first of all, what a geographer has to do with surprise, because by training, I'm a geographer. Well, I think any given academic discipline has a healthy imperialistic tendency any given academic discipline wants to explain the world through its own lens, right? So one way of doing this is to try to think through concepts such as surprise in geographical terms, which means that I looked at surprise in my work through the lens of a set of spatial concepts such as place, distance, territory, landscape, location, uh, and so on to try to provide a geographical account of, of surprise. So there's the linkage with geography. Now, why focusing on surprise is so important today? Because I think we live in times in which we are fully aware that any form of social planning, any form of government, any form of social control requires some expectations about the future. And part of a, the attempt to control the course of events involves improving our capacity. reminder of our human hubris, how often we think we are right and how often reality slaps us in the face and reminds us that we don't know as much as we think we know, right? We think we know what is around the corner, but in fact we know. And this links with my previous work on wisdom, because if you look at various theorizations of wisdom, a key element of wise people, of the sages, is that they have epistemic humility. They are humble. They don't think of themselves as wise. They realize how little they know about the world and therefore how often they are being surprised by how the world turns out, right? 
And if you think of surprise, the experience of surprise is always a reminder that there is a mismatch between how we think about the world, what we expect to happen, and what actually happens. It's a constant reminder that we need to learn continuously. We need to calibrate our mental models of the world so that we take into account the experience of uh, surprise. Um, and then, uh, based on this, uh, I, I wrote a paper for Progress in Human Geography called uh, Being Surprised and Surprising Ourselves, a Geography of Personal and Social Change, where basically I tried to look at how we can explain or provide new insights into processes of social change if we take at entry point the experience of surprise, right? And a fundamental distinction, even from the title of that paper, that I think is fascinating and has been underappreciated in the literature, is that there are two main classes of the experience of surprise. One is being surprised by something that happens to you from without. You have an expectation that something is going to happen and it fails to happen. That's being surprised at something outside yourself. Something failed to happen or happened in a different way that you expected. But the other type of experience of surprise is even more fascinating. It's us being able to surprise ourselves, right? Sometimes you find yourself doing something and then you look back at yourself or you look in the mirror and you wonder, why the hell did I do that? I didn't expect myself to be able to do that or to say such a thing and so on. So this capacity for us to surprise ourselves, I think is fascinating because it opens up a vista for thinking in new ways, in more subtle ways about human nature, what it means to be human, how much we know about ourselves uh, and how we conceptualize ourselves. And even though I'm a geographer, I'm a sort of a philosopher geographer because I like to reason from first principles, right? So you can't really have a cogent, sharp human geography if you fail to theorize the nature of human nature. How can you understand social relationships, the relationships between space and society, and have a discipline called human geography if you don't have a fairly clear theory of what it means to be human, right? You can only do human geography properly by first beginning to understand uh, or to have a coherent theory of what it means to be human, right? So you see that even though it seems a, a relatively random topic, surprise, actually when you look at the ramifications, it connects with wisdom, it connects with the current obsession to predict and control, it, it connects with uh, how we think about the nature of human nature and therefore about social sciences um, in, uh, in uh, general. I see, Dravos, you just said the current obsession of control and surveillance. And, and from the pandemic, we have seen the promotion of the authoritarian liberalism model, uh, you know, in Asia and China and so on. And you criticize a lot uh, what you would call the academic left to move, not, not to uh, protest or not to talk about. Uh, authoritarian liberalism is a way to avoid surprises in a way. It's a, it's a way to control, to control everything. And maybe because of that is so appealing because it seems that you don't have to be concerned much on the future because it's a big brother which is watching at you. Well, if you look at the psychological profile of all tyrants in history, from Stalin to Adolf Hitler and so on, a common feature they share is that they are control freaks. They are afraid of surprises. They do not want surprises. They cannot tolerate surprises. So uh, part of a means to control things is to try to predict the future and to shape how things are happening. But to connect surprise to the problematic of the pandemic, uh, one irony of that paper on surprise that I published is that it got published just before the pandemic started, right? So it doesn't really discuss uh, the pandemic itself. But reflecting back on what is happening during the pandemic, for me, the most worrying trend is within the academic left. So it's not a secret to anybody that most academics are left-leaning. They are politically to the center or to the left, right? So in this context of a left-leaning academia, what worries me today is that we have forgotten that the legacy of leftist thinking contains multiple threads of anti-authoritarian thinking. 
Think, for example, of the anarchist tradition in the academic left. Think of the work of Michel Foucault and the, the broad uh, types of uh, research it inspired in the various social sciences. Think of Gilles Deleuze and his work on the postscript to the society of control. Think of the work on biosecurity by Giorgio Agamben, the Italian political philosopher. Think of the work on carceral spaces, on imprisonment, on the geography of police and policing, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, even Karl Marx, if you read his work, you see that he was a lover of freedom, contrary to what people think, and he did appreciate life as being an, an embodiment of various freedoms. So against this legacy of leftist thinking that clearly cherishes freedom, and you see that even in the slogan of the French Revolution, right? You have liberté, égalité, fraternité. It was a recognition there that a single value being guided by a single value is troubling. And uh, when you push a value to its extreme, it becomes a vice. And we need to strike a balance between various values. And in the case of that leftist ethos of the French Revolution, it was liberté, égalité, fraternité. So in this historical context of the left having multiple traditions of anti-authoritarian and thinking. What worries me during the pandemic is that too many people on the academic left have failed to criticize the response to the pandemic on authoritarian grounds. They have failed to engage critically to look at the pandemic response in terms of ideology. And that's very problematic, but I think I am making sense of why it's happening. So even though I criticize this attitude of the academic left to reject the preoccupation with freedom and civil rights and human rights, I think uh, there are ways to understand why it is happening. And that's actually my most recent work. You won't see it on my webpage in my publication list because it's currently undertaking uh, peer review. We just submitted yesterday with my colleagues, uh, revised and resubmit for a paper on uh, uh, attitudes about uh, anti-authoritarianism in the academic left. Uh, and basically, I think the explanation has a lot to do with the fact that the right wing circles have appropriated, have stolen this preoccupation with freedom, with civil rights, with human rights. And then because of the influence of social media today, lots of people in the left have felt the need to publicly declare that they are not a Trump supporter, that they do not support the extreme right by mocking a preoccupation with civil rights, with human rights, with freedoms, and so on. So instead of defending a preoccupation with civil rights in left-wing circles, they very often have uh, made public statements to the extent that, oh, more rights, that's a Trumpist issue. If you defend civil rights or human rights, this betrays you as being a Trump supporter or being uh, uh, associated with the extreme right wing and so on. And the mainstream media has also contributed to this guilt by association, because if you look at the narratives of anti-lockdown protest in various metropoles like Berlin, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, systematically all media reports from the CNN and so on portray all these anti-lockdown protests as being white supremacist, Trumpist, conspiracy theorists, and, and the extreme right wingers. And this is simply not true. When you speak with those people and so on, you see that there are many people on the left who are also upset with the authoritarian uh, 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 management of the pandemic. Uh, but this guilt by association, this uh, uh, virtue signaling exercise whereby people feel the need to exculpate themselves, to disassociate themselves from being seen as a right winger has led many people to the left to abandon a preoccupation with freedom and in effect to gift the value of freedom, of civil rights, of human rights to the right wing. And I think that's very dangerous in the long term. I'm not speaking about 2020, 2021. I try to think decades into the future and to the intellectual legacy of what we have done during the pandemic, because there will be other pandemics to come in the future and so on and so forth. So the preoccupation here is really long term. And again, the key message that I want to, to send across is that freedom, liberty, civil rights, personal autonomy, uh, human rights are too important a, man, a matter to be gifted to the right-wingers. We should uh, keep 
that focus on freedom and liberty within the academic left in consonance with the motto of the French Revolution. So while also paying attention to equality, to fraternity, to other values that the left has traditionally cherished. But uh, let's not make the mistake to associate freedom with the extreme right wing. That's a very dangerous, that's a very dangerous association that will come back to bite us in the back. I see. Let me ask you one more question in relation to values, policies, and the pandemics. The, the cost and benefits of the pandemic were uh, are distributed and, and even among generations as well as income levels, genders, countries. We, we know that. But there is something positive, we may say, which is kind of, let's say, positive discrimination in the sense that el elderly people are being first to be vaccinated almost everywhere, just because they are the, more, the most vulnerable people, not just because they are the, the, more, the more useful in economic terms. So this, this says something positive about us, about Western democratic societies after all. Okay, we can discuss this issue of positive changes brought about by the pandemic. I think the most important positive development is the progress we are making in vaccination, in vaccine theory and practice, in vaccine development. It used to take several years to build up a, a vaccine to, a new, uh, to a, a new virus, and now we have speeded up the process uh, uh, very dramatically, and I think that really is uh, good news on the technological front. In terms of uh, protecting the vulnerable and how we are allocating costs and benefits in society, I think really we need to zoom out uh, from a specific group and to think about axes of social difference and to pay attention to social difference and to spatial difference. And if you look at the various axes of social difference involved in the politics of non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as uh, social distancing, lockdowns, closing businesses, closing schools, and so on. I think, uh, in general, you can detect winners and losers across multiple axes of social difference. Uh, for example, one group that has been harmed disproportionately by the pandemic response have been people with disabilities. Many people have forgotten about them, but something that seems not very troubling to the majority of us, to able people, for example, something as apparently trivial as a mask mandate can create a lot of problems for people who are deaf, to people who are on the autistic spectrum and so on. So on the social axis of ability versus disability, people with disabilities uh, have been forgotten in the pandemic. And I think that's really, uh, really pro problematic. Then if we look at the axis of age, you are right that uh, we are distributed va distributing vaccines uh, with an eye to protecting the elderly, which of course is the right thing to do because they are the most vulnerable. The single most important finding about this virus is that it doesn't hit randomly, but instead its impact is directly correlated with age. There is an exponential increase in mortality with age. So it absolutely makes sense on all sorts of counts, both moral and public health counts uh, to, to distribute the vaccine preferentially to the elderly. But let's, let's also not forget that uh, when it comes to discussing age, we, need, we open up the can of worms called intergenerational equity. In philosophy, in moral philosophy, there are a lot of debates whether it is right for one generation to be sacrificed at the expense of another generation, whether it is right for one generation uh, to be the sacrificial lamb in order to protect another generation. And uh, philosopher Peter Godfrey Smith has published recently some reflections uh, on that that are very interesting. And yes, even though through the pandemic we are doing the right thing to protect the elderly, I wonder if a lot of that, especially closing schools and so on, isn't done at the expense of harming the younger generations that are coming from behind. The problem with the harm to the younger generations is that it is going to be delayed. And another obsession of my work is with delays, as you know, from uh, engaging with it. And uh, 
the harms to the elderly are immediate and visible. People end up in the ICU, they die, uh, there is death, there is suffering, there is hospitalization. But what about the harm we are causing to the younger generations because they do not get a fair chance at reducing illiteracy, at getting proper education and so on. We know that lockdowns amplify illiteracy. We know that illiteracy leads long-term to poverty. And we know that poverty link, leads long-term to reduced longevity, to worse health, to less well-being over the life course. But these dynamics happen over the span of decades. We will realize the hidden costs of having royally screwed the younger generations many years from now, right? It's not just that temporarily unemployment is high among recent graduates. That's a very temporary phenomenon, right? caused by the closure of businesses and so on. But I'm thinking about the children of today who are now 10, 11, 12 years old, who are supposed to learn how to read and write and how much they are damaged by poor schooling because they have to do it virtually and how much they, they will lead to amplified educational uh, differences, gaps between social classes and to the propagation of poverty, of social disadvantage further down the road in the decades uh, to come. Another axis of social difference that I think uh, hasn't been fully attended to in the lockdowns is by race, right? We know that uh, lockdown preferentially benefits the whites, but when you look at politics of lockdown in the global south, a lot of global south economies are suffering economically dramatically because of the politics of lockdown imposed on them. They have a very young population that is not very vulnerable to the virus. The mortality rates for young people for this virus are extremely low, but they have adopted like a bl blanket policy, this politics of uh, this policy of, uh, of uh, lockdowns. And as a result, the benefits that they reap from, uh, uh, from all these uh, lockdown uh, policies are way uh, 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 less than the cost that they are going to pay in terms of economic suffering uh, and so on. So there is also a global north, global south axis that keeps reproducing itself through other forms, for example, access to vaccines, right? It is true that we are giving the vaccine preferentially to the elderly, but those elderly happen to be rich people living in the global north and very often white people. What about the elderly of the global south, right? Many countries have adopted a very territorial nationalistic policy of keeping the vaccines for their own folk, right? We have closed ourselves to other people. Nationalism is rampant and we want to vaccinate our elderly, the Canadian elderly or the French elderly, right? And then in this form of uh, nationalism, of vaccination nationalism, we forget about, for example, the vulnerable elderly in the global south, who, who knows at what point in the future will have access to, uh, to vaccination, let's say. Um, so uh, it, it's a really broad topic. And I think as critical social scientists, really we need uh, to go beyond tweeting and posting on Facebook short tweets. And we really need to get back to what we need to do best, namely proper academic scholarship based on serious empirical research on quantifying costs and benefits, on paying attention to the role of geography in all of this and to the multiple axes of social difference that shape the differential impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions. And one danger here, I think, and I don't think the danger is sufficiently appreciated, is that it's very easy to focus on costs and benefits that can be quantified, right? Because then it's easy to do a quantitative analysis. But what about hidden costs, symbolic costs to non-pharmaceutical interventions? For example, Lots of people complain about masks because they prevent normal human relationships, let's say, right? But that's a hidden cost. It, how do you go about quantifying the cost to good quality human relationships coming from the fact that people are masked, that they treat each other as a vector of disease, that when they see one another, they prefer to jump into traffic and get hit by a car, than cross the street on the same sidewalk with another person and so on. This hidden social cost, this symbolic cost of practicing mask mandates, of practicing uh, social distancing and so on, 
uh, pr pretty much impossible to quantify, but this doesn't make them any less, uh, any less important. And I think there is a lot of work for critical phenomenologists, for critical social scientists to, to open up these, these issues and to provide some deeper reflection that really goes beyond a mere tweet or a mere Facebook post. Too many academics in the last two years have posted on their blogs, on Twitter or on Facebook, but I think we need to get back to serious scholarship based on peer review, based on gathering empirical data, based on uh, doing uh, what we know best, think critically about the issues uh, involved. Let's go a little bit deeper on the cost-benefit uh, decision-making criteria, to also a criteria to assess public policy. You have said that the neoliberal calculus based on the cost benefit, which tries to maximize welfare for society is kind of a meaning, meaningless indicator when we are dealing with tragic dilemmas. And then you have explored new ways to understand irrational decision, saying that it's not that irrational, that instead of uh, looking to maximize uh, welfare, according to this quantification, is more useful to look at the at the risk to reduce risk uh, instead of welfare maximization, and to consider concepts which are more qualitative, such as resilience, security, sustainability. Uh, that this will be more rational, actually, when dealing with a world of increasing uncertainty. Uh, could you further elaborate this idea? Yes, well, of course, neoliberalism is something we love to criticize in critical geography and in critical <laughs> social science. Uh, it's a very nebulous entity. The more we are researching neoliberalism, the more unclear we are as to what it actually is. The way I like to think of it is that neoliberalism is an ideology or a discursive practice, if you want, and it's an important flavor that is coloring the manifestation of capitalism in the last few decades, right? And beyond that uh, opening remark, of course, different, uh, different academic disciplines in the social sciences have looked at different issues pertaining to, to neoliberalism. But I think one important thing to, to remember about neoliberalism is how guilty neoliberalism uh, uh, as an ideology is of what is currently happening during the pandemic, right? Normally, we should think of our hospitals as saving us. That's why we have hospitals. Hospitals are there to save us. But because of the neoliberal underfunding of public health, now we are in the very bizarre situation where we are asked, lay citizens, to save our hospitals. Instead of hospitals saving us, as it should normally happen in a wealthier state with a well-funded public health system and so on, because we have systematically and dramatically underfunded uh, public uh, health in multiple countries, including uh, Canada, and I'm most familiar with the situation here, we have very limited hospitalization capacity, very limited ICU capacity, a shortage of doctors and nurses. We don't have uh, enough uh, 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 vaccine sites, uh, and this happens not only in Canada, but in also other parts of the world. So neoliberalism really is an important ideology to unmask when we look for what to blame about uh, people dying during the pandemic, because the pandemic caught us unprepared largely because we have made a political choice before the pandemic to underfund the welfare state, right? Think about neoliberalism. No, it spread in the Western world beginning with the 70s, especially the election of Ronald Reagan in the United States and Margaret Thatcher in the UK. Uh, it became a dominant ideology after the collapse of the Berlin uh, of the Berlin uh, Wall. It spread like wildfire, so to say, in other parts of the world. Uh, and many new generations uh, don't even realize how ideological uh, neoliberalism is. For them, is the air they breathe, right? They don't realize how dangerous it is. Uh, and ironically, the, the very ideology that is responsible for bringing us in the current pandemic crisis is also the ideology that pits us against one another. Instead of looking uh, and unmasking the unfunding of the underfunding of the public uh, healthcare system, what neoliberal ideology have 
has come up with during the pandemic is to get us to turn people against one another. If there are new cases of COVID in the population, blame the people who don't mask or blame the people who don't practice social distancing. Uh, this ideological move has shifted blame away from the structural force of neoliberalism, from this ideology uh, that has led to the practical consequence of underfunded public health systems, and instead has pitted us against one another. It's a very clever device of bypassing responsibility. Instead of accepting that our hospitals are underfunded and we don't have enough ICU beds and so on because of neoliberalism, now people, instead of blaming the system, instead of looking at the ideology behind all this, they blame one another. And we engage in witch hunting and we engage in Twitter and Facebook wars saying that guy is an asshole because he doesn't wear a mask. Uh, that guy is an asshole because he doesn't practice social distance. I hope you die because you refuse to comply with non-pharmaceutical interventions. So it's a very clever maneuvering ideological uh, move whereby instead of us looking collectively to the ideology that, has, that is responsible for all this, that very ideology has dissimulated its responsibility in the pandemic by cleverly putting the blame on the people, right? Think about the ideology of we are in this together, right? or do your part to save grandma. All this putting a personal responsibility on the individual is a typical move of neoliberal ideology. And I'm really surprised that so many people on the left have fallen prey to this ideological mixture of, uh, of uh, medical advice and ideology instead of seeing for what it is an attempt by neoliberal uh, discursive practices to hide uh, their own responsibility in getting us where we are, and instead dissimulating that responsibility by turning people against one another, sowing social division, uh, amplifying existing social discrepancies, which were great, which were very big to begin with. Even before the pandemic, many social theorists were really worried about the increasing polarization of Western societies. No, think, for example, of what. Trump has created in the US. No, uh, with a normal election, even if a Republican president gets elected, you wait your turn until the next election. Once Trump got elected, the American electorate became exceedingly polarized at each other's throats. The quality of public discourse has declined markedly. So even before the pandemic started, there was an excessive polarization, too much sowing of social division and so on. And all those cleavages in society have been exacerbated. And I think it will take quite a bit of time for them, uh, for them uh, to heal. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's move. Draws to the concept of distance, which is kind of fundamental concept on, on geography. And before we were talking that uh, the same time that I think Creswell is very much interested in the idea of place, uh, Saskia Sassen was interested in our conversation on the, on, the, on the size of the cities, the right size of the cities, which is an old discussion in, in the history of geography that, that continues and maybe never we will have a a final answer because uh, technology changing and human uh, values and behavior and policies as well. So the, the, the question remains. Now, what, what are you thinking about how distance is changing in relation to connectivity, in relation to proximity? What, what is the meaning of distance for us today? Okay, so where I come from in terms of distance, I read a lot outside geography and I came across this theory in experimental psychology called construal level theory, which is an empirical based growing research program that is really fascinating. And by engaging with that work in experimental psychology, I realized that I can contribute something to my home discipline of geography by rescuing the concept of distance from, this, from its traditional entrenched association with quantitative geography and positivistic social science. To go back a little bit to create some context, in the history of geography, distance has been a key concept in the high day of the theoretical and quantitative revolution in geography, which happened in the 50s and the 60s. What happened at the time is that geographers became really upset that people laugh when they say out publicly that they are geographers. Everybody perceived at the time geography to be 
descriptive, primitive, atheoretical, not really a proper science. And then all these young ambitious geographers, a new generation of them in the 50s and the 60s, attempted to transform geography into a proper science. And the way to make geography respectable, according to them, is to make quantification central and to develop theory in geography, to make theory in geography into a theoretical and quantitative discipline. And part of that attempt to quantify geography, to develop quantitative methodologies, was developing the concept of distance, right? As a reflection of how obsessed we were to gain a degree of respectability for the other social sciences, for geography to, uh, to become a respectable discipline, Waldo Tobler, one of the pioneers of the quantitative revolution of the 60s, went so far to even propose a so-called first law of geography, trying to emulate, to imitate physics, right? We have the three principles of thermodynamics, we have the Newtonian uh, laws of mechanics and so on. So trying to give a facade of respectability to geography, he even proposed a first law of geography, which as it happens, is about distance. The first law of geography, according to Waldo Tobler, is that nearby things are more related to one another than to distant things, right? Now, there are all sorts of ironies about that first law of geography. The first irony is that we never managed as a discipline to come up with other laws. That's the only law we have, right? We don't have a second or a third or a fourth law, right? So that already becomes to come across as comical. But the other important thing about that first law is that even as it was proposed in the 70s, beginning with the late 70s and the 80s and the 90s, we see what? The rise of the internet, telecommunication technology, new discourses about the creation of a global village, about the flattening of distancing, about uh, uh, distance no longer being relevant to understanding the world and so on. So with the rise of the internet, with the reduction in the cost of transportation and telecommunication technologies um, and so on, uh, Increasingly, that law seemed uh, not, not simply comical because it's the only law of geography, but also strictly incorrect. You can think of plenty of examples where nearby things are not necessarily more related to other nearby things, but actually they are related with very distant things. Think about how economic uh, activity is organized today. A great deal of economic activity today is organized in so-called global production networks or global value chains that stretch the world World, right? You have the headquarters in Silicon Valley, you have a branch facility in Hong Kong or in Taiwan, you have various distributors in Europe or in Australia, and you have all sorts of networks of economic activity that stretch the globe. And very often you can have companies in the same region that do not necessarily communicate with one another, but they communicate with other economic entities very far away. Think also about people, about researchers, right? Very often we are in the situation today where you don't quite know what research colleagues in your own department are doing. You live on the same floor with them. Maybe you are even neighbor with them in the next office. But because your research interests are on a particular topic, you have more in common with another researcher with whom you are quartering paper who lives at the other end of the world, right? And then you keep in touch with that researcher via Zoom, via Microsoft Teams and so on. So because of the rise of the internet, the reduction in the cost of transportation, uh, the pressure on economic activity uh, to reduce costs and so on, and the general forces of globalization, increasingly today, we realize that that first law of geography has too many exceptions to be properly considered a law. So it remains a useful teaching device. When I teach the history of geography to my students, I mentioned Waldo Tobler, I mentioned the first law of geography, but it's really a useful entry point to explain why that first law is so severely flawed, right? But coming back to my work on uh, distance, because of this first law of geography, distance became associated mentally in the minds of younger generations of geographers with the quantitative revolution of the 60s. And since then, that quantitative revolution has become obsolete in geography. Geography now has become a very politicized discipline. We try to make the world a better place. We are explicitly declaring ourselves to be to the left. We are fighting for making the world a better place. So in the light of newer generations of geographers, Geographers, 
a preoccupation with the distance seems obsolete because of this guilt by association, because mentally the concept is still associated with the old fashioned quantitative geography of the 60s. So my contribution to theorizing distance has been to rescue distance from its mental association with the quantitative revolution of the 60s. I try to develop a subjective understanding of distance. Uh, a subjective understanding that thinks of distance not as something objective where you measure it in kilometers, in miles or in meters, but something that is a function of the individual. And for this, I built on this theory from experimental psychology, uh, construal level theory that identifies four interrelated dimensions of distance. So it thinks of distance as a multidimensional concept and spatial distance is only one of those four dimensions of distance. The other three dimensions of distance are temporal distance. So we also think of time in terms of distance. For example, very often you hear yourself saying, oh, this will happen in the distant future, right? So we use the adjective distant to refer to the future. Or you say, I no longer care about that thing. It happened in the distant past, right? So temporal distance is one dimension of distance in addition to uh, geographical or spatial distance. A third dimension of distance, very important to our times because we speak about practicing social distancing is social distance, right? Which has nothing to do with geography per se, but social distance is your degree of perceived relatedness to other people, no? You consider your spouse, socially more close than another relative that is more distant from you. You consider your best friend socially closer to you than a distant acquaintance, right? We again use the language of distance to speak about our social relationships. And finally, a fourth dimension of subjective distance is hypotheticality or uncertainty. So scenarios, visions of the futures that we deem unlikely, we perceive them as distant possibilities. We even refer to them. It's not worth considering that scenario because it's a merely distant possibility, right? So this subjective understanding of distance is fascinating because it goes beyond metrics beyond simply quantifying distance and it focuses on how different people with different background with different geographical locations perceive distance differently along all these four dimensions of distance temporal spatial hypothetical and uh, social and again uh, it's fascinating that i've done this work on distance in a paper published in 2016 then in 2020 uh, I was asked to write the entry on distance for the International Encyclopedia of Human Geography to summarize the concept in light of these new developments. And it's again ironic that just as I published those uh, two papers, then COVID happened and I found myself uh, walking on the street and thinking about distance in very different terms because suddenly practicing social distancing has become a non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, uh, ridden with ideological messaging, uh, and we were all supposed to practice. So from writing papers on distance, theorizing distance, I found myself practicing social distancing in everyday life and seeing bizarre behavior on the streets, such as people rather taking the risk of getting hit by a car and jumping off the sidewalk into the traffic to avoid another person on the sidewalk, right? And again, I began to think about how come public health has, uh, has never taken into account to quantify these hidden symbolic costs of getting people to treat each other as a vector of disease, reducing one another to a, to a bio, biological weapon, treating one another as a vector of disease. For all the putative benefits of practicing social distancing, we need to remember that any achievement comes with a loss, that whatever putative benefits uh, social distancing has, it also has all these hidden uh, symbolic costs. And this messaging to practice social distancing also happened at the worst time in history when our Western societies are already exceedingly polarized, uh, where there is uh, uh, an undermining of the social glue that is supposed to tie us, uh, uh, to tie us uh, uh, together. So these are just some reflections that were prompted by uh, all this uh, engagement with um, with distance okay you, you know you know drivers that i i love the 
the obsolete geography from the 50s and 60s is that I admire a lot the location of geography by Peter Hager, uh, which actually is a platonic kind of platonic abstraction, kind of mathematic uh, language, which is similar to the welfare economics by the group that they manage in welfare economics to have three laws, not only one. But anyway, it's, it's kind of platonic world of mathematics, which is far away from, from human values, feelings, and practices. But anyway, if, if we take them as a as a ideal reference, it's kind of beautiful, let's say, from the aesthetical point of view. From this, could you explain to us what is the basis for, for the demoniac geography you practice? Because okay, so- The kind of beautiful and very attractive obscure name yeah what it means for you yeah so in 2017 i published a paper called demonic geographies and whatever else i might have gotten wrong about the paper i think i got the right title because it catches <laughs> people's attention shortly after publishing that paper i actually received a handwritten letter from an occultist group in england who completely got wrong the message of the paper and they invited me to the spiritualist circles and so on. <laughs> so it was a really fascinating experience about writing about something and then having that message completely misinterpreted and misconstrued. Uh, but uh, to understand what demonic geography is, I put a quote at the beginning of the paper from the great uh, 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 Joseph Campbell, who did a lot of research on the anthropology of myths. So he looked at myths in traditional society. He's one of the leading names in the study of mythology. And he noticed that in Western culture, demon has a negative association with evil, with uh, evil spirits and so on. But if you look at the Greek etymology of the term demon, in Greek, demon means the spirit of life, the, the affirmation of life, is the force of life. So what I mean by demonic geographies is really an approach to practicing human geography that is a materialist and deflationary metaphysics. And I'm gonna explain those terms, uh, but the idea is that it's a way, an encouragement to geographers to approach human geography without taking in their geographical theorizing the bagage, the luggage of a very problematic terms such as souls, spirits, minds, integrated stable selves, or the illusion of conscious free will. So there is a lot of work today in neuroscience, in the philosophy of mind, based on the latest findings in, the, in brain research that shows that a lot of our way of thinking in lay terms in the West is very problematic and not based on actual science. A lot of myths we believe in, such as believing in the illusion of conscious free will, believing that there is a mind separate from the brain, believing that we have a soul, such as in looking for your soulmate, or after you die, your soul goes to heaven, uh, believing in a stable, coherent self, and so on. Many of these uh, theoretical or conceptual baggage that we take from everyday life is actually not grounded in actual uh, scientific evidence. It's questionable. So demonic geographies was a provocation I launched to fellow uh, human geographers to try to think and practice human geography without smuggling in through the back door all these problematic assumptions that humans have minds separate from brains, souls separates from, separated from bodies, um, uh, and all sorts of immaterial entities, right? So we can say that this approach encourages a materialist metaphysics and a deflationary metaphysics. Materialist means that it doesn't recognize ideal entities that you cannot see or touch, such as souls or minds, abstractions that you cannot prove scientifically, right? And it's a deflationary metaphysics in the sense that it bursts our ego, right? Traditionally, in Western culture, we have, we have put human beings on a pedestal. We are above the animal kingdom, right? You cannot put in the same crowd humans with pigs, with cows, with mosquitoes. We think of ourselves as superior to the rest of the animal kingdom, right? That's the essence of humanism, right? So uh, demonic geography is a deflationary metaphysics or an anti-humanist approach because it takes the human species off the pedestal on which it put itself. 
It doesn't recognize humans as being a special kind of animal that deserves special considerability over and above the rest of the animal kingdom. And then you might ask, why is that needed? Well, it is needed for a variety of reasons, but I have been teaching at Brock the Introduction to Environmental Geography course ever since I was hired in 2003. And one thing I always teach my students is that things like sustainable development, reducing CO2 emissions are only surface technocentric measures to fight the global environmental crisis. If you really want to go in depth to fight the global environmental crisis, you need to look at the underlying philosophical assumptions and ethical assumptions that guide the way in which we think ourselves in relationship to nature. And because of the legacy of humanistic thinking in the Western culture, because we have always pedestalized the human species, because we have always thought of ourselves apart from nature and above nature, we have looked down on nature. We have thought of nature as a resource given to us by God to do whatever we please with it. So a great deal of the current environmental crisis can be traced back to our attitudes to nature. We think that we are better than nature. We think that we can control nature. We think that we are a superior species. We think that our mission as a civilization is to raise ourselves above nature, as Catherine Hepburn was saying in the Out of Africa movie. And all this way of thinking, all this stratified ontology that puts humans on a pedestal and all the other uh, components of nature below is really devastating because it trains us to relate to nature in the wrong way. By practicing demonic geographies, we are pretty much put on the same ontological plane with the other animals. We are not apart from nature, but a part of nature. We are in nature, we are not separate from it. And as such, because we have much more in common with the other animals than we think, caring for mother nature, caring for Gaia as a planet becomes our way of being in the world. So if you want the deep underlying ethical and metaphysical promise of demonic geographies is that it is a, a deep way of thinking on how we can reconcile ourselves with the environment, with nature, and how we can learn to inhabit the world in this era of the Anthropocene, right, when there is so much environmental devastation, uh, uh, by uh, looking at what we have in common with nature instead of emphasizing what separates us from nature. So in this sense, demonic geography is an anti-humanist approach because it sees humanism as a form of species, putting one species on, uh, on a pedestal. And again, the way you theorize the world, the ontological assumptions you make about how the world is, end up shaping your ethical and political choices, right? So, uh, uh, so this has direct consequences. So to come back to your uh, mentioning of Peter Haggett and locational analysis, the conflict between demonic geographies and locational analysis couldn't be more stark, more, uh, more direct, simply because a key assumption of locational analysis, and it's a very beautiful way of thinking about the world. And I agree with you that from an aesthetic point of view, that focus on beautiful geometries, on uh, uh, mathematical precision, on forecasting and testing your model and testing your parameters and so on is really fascinating. It developed a unique vocabulary. My hats off to Peter Haggett and to the other uh, proponents of the quantitative revolution for developing such a beautiful way of thinking. But, uh, so I'm not developing, let's say, demonic geographies and other approaches in geography. My philosophy is not that one approach is supposed to replace the other. No, I think of the various way of practicing geography as hats that you put on your head. So let's not abandon vocational analysis or shift to demonic geographies. Let's think of them as attitudes, as a lenses through which we can look at the world and practice geography. So I'm not arguing from abandoning one and embracing the other. I'm arguing for encouraging a variety of ways of looking at the world and realizing that each of these ways of looking at the world is a constellation of epistemic gains and epistemic losses that locational analysis has its strengths, but it also has its weaknesses. Demonic geographies has its strength, but it also has its weaknesses, right? So uh, uh, to amplify my point about the contrast between demonic geography and locational analysis, at the heart of the modeling done 
under the banner of locational analysis is rational choice theory, the assumption that economic agents and individual agents make decisions based on the tenets of rational choice theory, right? But in demonic geographies, there is no such thing as rational choice theory and so on, because the very concept of conscious free will is put under question mark, right? So uh, a, a key presumption of locational choice is thrown uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the air, so to say. Uh, but uh, locational analysis, again, remains an important way of thinking about the world for all the criticism leveraged against it. And again, uh, it is true that it shouldn't be stu studied just as a period in the history of geography. A great deal of uh, the study of uh, urban economics, uh, agglomeration economies, locational decisions of firms uh, can be done based on the principles of locational analysis. So it's still a very important intellectual a weapon, and I think geographers should be proud that such an approach was developed. Speaking of Peter Haggett, one thing that people do not know or do not know well at all, and I want uh, again to connect the dots here, people do not know that Peter Haggett was also the leading geographer who developed the field of medical geography, right? When I make pronouncements about the pandemic and so on, I'm not just some stupid geographer. I also have a number of publications in medical geography journals. So there is such a field called medical geography. And one thing that people do not know is that Peter Haggett was the pioneer who developed the field of medical geography in the 60s by uh, uh, studying epidemics through quantitative uh, spatial modeling. So he applied the spatial quantitative tools he developed in locational analysis. He applied them to the study of the spread of various diseases, infectious diseases. So a lot of the epidemiological tools used today in public uh, health, in epidemiology and so on, were actually developed originally in geography in the 60s and the 70s in the field of spatial uh, epidemiology. And this intellectual connection is forgotten today. So please don't laugh or dismiss when you see somebody saying something about the pandemic and then they mention, and by the way, I'm a geographer. <laughs> Being a geographer doesn't mean that you are clueless about public health. Epid Think about the very name. The World Health Organization declared the SARS epidemic a pandemic because the epidemic spread globally. You only move from labeling something a pandemic as opposed to an epidemic when that pandemic has covered the globe. It has a full geographical expression, right? So in the very definition of the term pandemic, there is a geographical implication that now that particular epidemic that started in Wuhan, China, has spread around the world, right? And then uh, attempts to mitigate the spread of the virus and so on, all are based on spatial thinking, you know, on identifying hotspots, on quarantining people, on isolating those infected, on, on creating barri barriers and various distances to prevent the spread of the virus uh, and so on. So let's not forget also this health or medical ramification of locational uh, analysis. Yeah, thank you, Raul. Let me ask you, because I just realized my surprise that we had about one hour. <laughs> but uh, one question I have to ask you, which is about your feelings, uh, the perception of the future, of the geography in which we will live in the coming future. So this idea of, of living in a you know, hyper-connected, smart city made of many different slow cities where we, ex we will experience distance as a proximity, let's say. So this experiencing distance as proximity in the slow cities we live, which are connected globally. So we also will experience connectivity. So this, 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 this idea of living in, uh, you know, hyper-connected smart city made of many slow cities, this seems to you over simplistic, this seem to you interesting, or what other vision you have for the kind of geography, physical geography, medical geography, in which we will live in the future? Okay, so obviously the, the job of predicting the future is very uh, uh, 
very dangerous as there is plenty of uh, empirical evidence showing that we have a really abysmal record at predicting the future, even the nearby future, let alone the distant future. Uh, that's why I did all that work on uh, surprise, on wisdom in Chinese thought. And again, a key distinction drawn in Chinese thought is that it is possible to foresee the unfolding of an imminent situation if you attune yourself to the environment, if you are paying careful attention to the seeds of change, but that the long-term future cannot be predicted and it's better to make peace with that. So uh, drawing this caveat about the overall difficulty of uh, predicting the future and so on, I think what I do have to add is that central planners, people involved in any task of governance or of planning, very often in their attempts to predict the future commit one fatal mi mistake, one fatal flaw that pops up over and over and over again. And that is they forget to take into account delays in social systems. So very often they overestimate the pace at which things change and then they are disappointed when reality doesn't meet their expectation because they haven't taken into account how much delays impact uh, the, the rate of social turnover, the rate of technological change, economic processes of change and so on. And there are multiple types of delays, but really we need to think of the evolving social landscape as a time geography that is shaped by delay. And I have never seen more disappointed people in my life than when I teach my students in the environmental geography class I teach, how little and how slowly the energy system we currently have is changing. The, the problem with the younger generation is that every day they are on Twitter or on Facebook and they see flashy headlines, very promising headlines about wind power, about solar cells, about renewable forms of energy and so on. And then they get excited. Oh my God, we are doing something about climate change and we are producing renewable energy and so on. And then I show them charts predicting the future of energy consumption and energy production from the Energy International Association looking into the year 2000. 50 and their jaws drop when they see those charts because the system unless you squint your eye to look at the graphs the system barely changes why because the energy system has a deep level of inertia built into it today we are dealing with the energy system that we have created 30 or 40 or 50 years ago right think of the process of being a nuclear power plant you need paperwork you need a bureaucratic approval you need safety test environmental impact assessment then once you build the nuclear power plant you need to run it for a few decades to get your money back amortization costs and so on so once you set something in motion that thing has to run its life course which stretches over decades so even though you see flashy news today about the world shifting to renewable energy and so on it will take decades for those things to show up in the charts as a substantial difference because of these delays in uh, in the inertia of the energy system and i gave this only as an example because i vividly see the faces of my students in the environmental course when i show them those charts and i explain how delays work in social systems the same about uh, changing morality and values and so on because people today very often live in western countries for about 80 to an average life expectancy of 80 years old very often social mores, attitudes about racism, about uh, homophobia and so on, don't change as fast as people wish, simply because once you grow up and are raised with a given set of values, it requires slow generational turnovers, it requires older people to die, younger people to come from behind for the overall aggregate impact of a change in how we think about homophobia or racism uh, uh, to percolate. So my my key piece of advice to anybody engaged in planning, in attempting to predict the future and so on, always take into account the role of delays in, uh, in assessing what is likely to happen. And this is also true of the pandemic. Just look at the multiple layers of delay, delays involved in vaccination, right? It takes time to run a randomized controlled trial to prove that the vaccine work. Once the vaccine is proven to work in a randomized controlled tri trial, it takes time for regulatory agencies to approve it. Then it takes time for producers of the vaccine to ramp up their manufacturing capacities to actually fabricate enough doses of the vaccine. 
Then there are transportation and distribution delays for the vaccine to be sent to uh, medical centers and so on. Then once people get vaccinated, it takes at least two weeks for our immune system to develop proper antibodies and for the response to the vaccine to, to kick in, right? So even when you think through the pandemic, you see the long chains of delays and one piles up on the other. And uh, uh, that's, an important, uh, that's an important thing to bear in mind. But I think the good point about the focus on delays when we try to predict social systems, I think is the best cognitive training for building patience. I am a very impatient person and nothing about trying to educate my sense of patience has worked better than me studying delays in social systems. By engaging intellectually in understanding how delays operate in social systems, I think I did become over time a more patient uh, person because now I'm acutely aware of the various delays involved. And I understand that very often there's very little that you can do about it. You have to bid your time. You have to wait for things to run uh, their course as it were. So to come back to your question about this vision of the future with uh, the play of distances, with uh, uh, our redefinition of the sense of proximity, because at one level we are connected with distant others through technology, through Zoom, through Microsoft Teams, uh, maybe in the footsteps of the pandemic, we will see a spread of virtual work of people working from home more than before. There seems to be some social trend in that direction. Uh, while at the same time, humans are humans and we still have that primitive need to socialize, to hang around with other people in physical proximity. So it is quite clear one lesson from the pandemic is that Zooming is no substitute for real life meeting, right? It's one thing to have a Zoom party and another thing to actually show up in a room, shake people, hug people, get drunk and so on. Virtual communication and virtual interaction is only a modest substitute for physical intercourse, for touching, for hugging, for uh, normal, uh, normal social uh, intercourse. So I think that's a fairly obvious lesson from the uh, from the uh, pandemic. And uh, I think the other thing to bear in mind when we try to predict what shape our ways of life and the economic system will take and our way of living together in what forms of urban uh, organization will take. Another thing that I learned this time from uh, the late Alvin Toffler, the famous futurologist, one thing that struck me in his work was he said, when you try to predict the future, remember that whether the future will turn good or bad depends on the values of the person making the prediction. You might think that from your standpoint, a particular turnaround of events is going to be bad, but that's only for you, you, the guy who makes the prediction. But the people who will live in the future that you are predicting will be other people, newer generations that come from behind. And as there is intergenerational turnover, newer generations have a different hierarchy of values than you have. They will value different things. They will despise other things. So how the future will be, whether it will be good or bad, it's always a subjective uh, issue because people with different value systems will relate to that future either as a positive development or as a negative development and so on. So again, when we predict the future in the year 2050, by then I will be long dead, I'm expecting, right? unless I'm unusually uh, scoring high on uh, longevity. So predicting 2050 is an exercise in trying also to guess how will the people who, who will be mature, who will be in full bloom in the year 2050, will value things around them. What will they value more, safety and health, or will they still give a shit about freedom, right? One worry about the pandemic for me is that the younger generations seem to value too much safety, longevity, an obsessive preoccupation with health, and they don't value enough freedom, civil liber liberties, and human rights. And that's worrying to me, right? But again, that's my subjective feeling because I personally value freedom and human rights. If this new generations don't value them as much as me, for them, a future that is authoritarian might be heaven on earth. Because from their standpoint, they want big brother, they want big government to keep them safe and healthy. If that's what they want, then for them, the future will be rosy. Uh, 
For a person like me who cares more about civil rights and freedom, for me, that future would be dystopian. So let's no, not always forget, uh, in addition to that important caveat about the role of delays, let's also not forget the, the role of values and how as we predict the future, one thing that changes is the people that will get to experience the uh, future and that the values of those people uh, will change as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I was so fascinate, fascinated by, by your explanation and this talk that I even forgot to read the questions from our listeners and so I apologize, all of you sending sending questions to Dragos, but you know, uh, I made the mistake not to not to read the questions and follow and listening carefully what Dragos is telling to us. So thank you everybody, thank you Dragos very much for. All thank you for having me. It's been a, a really uh, amazing opportunity to think and uh, make connections between things I haven't. Uh, managed to connect before and uh, again uh, I haven't been to a conference in quite a while with everything being suspended and so on so it's nice to have interactions uh, that are transcontinental now I'm in Toronto you are in Barcelona and the audience is probably uh, all over the world yeah. uh, so uh, I hope that uh, I haven't wasted your time and that uh, uh, everybody got some uh, spark to think about from uh, from the conversation I think it was fascinating and, and very useful Thank you very much, Dragos. Thank you very much.